God is God. God is the judge. If I stay angry, I'm the foolish one. Because only God can be angry and just completely all at the same time. He's loving, merciful, kind, and also he could be just all at the same time. But when humans, that's the whole thing. I'm not, I'm not built to handle the type of anger that people might try or life might try to put on me. And God's like, you're right, I didn't build you for that. So let me be God, you be man. Back to 15 and 1, 2 Samuel, and I mean, eight signs that bitterness is at work in your life. Eight signs that the spirit of Absalom is growing in your life. Verse 1. After this, or what we just talked about, David brought Absalom back to the kingdom. And it happened, it happened that Absalom provided himself with chariots and, and horses, and 50 men to run before him. So he had this whole entourage. He was looking the part of a king, and, and he knew what he was doing. Um, he, was, he was about to get his revenge, and he was doing it on the sly. He was a smart guy, and he thought out the plan, and he knew how he was going to do it. But here's the problem with self-promotion. Whatever height you attain through self-promotion, you must yourself maintain. But when God promotes you, He will fight for you. He will keep you in whatever position He has put you in. And self-promotion will get you there for a minute, but it just gets exhausting to stay there. But because you don't have that, the grace to, to endure it. I, I know folks that have stole folks from, done stuff. They got it from me, but they couldn't keep it. They might have stole it, but they didn't have the grace for it. And if you keep your heart sweet, whatever stolen, God will get back to you seven times. He's that type of God. We're talking about the eight signs of bitterness. Sign number one, we just saw it. Bitterness is deceptive. It always makes you feel justified taking matters in your own hands without looking to God. So when you're bitter, it's just like anger. Anger almost feels like prophetic. I mean, you, you're so right until it's amazing, like two hours later, it's like, ooh. <laughs> but in the moment, you feel so right. And he had so much bitterness in his heart, he felt he had a right to steal the kingdom from his daddy. Now Absalom would rise early. So Absalom, he had a strong work ethic, but so does the devil. How many of y'all know that? You see, in every person, there's a little bit of good, and in every good person, there's a little bit of bad. Which brings us to point number two. Bitter people still have admirable qualities. Meaning you could be functioning in the church. You could be singing in the worship team. God might use you despite you. Hear what I'm saying? But just because there's some good things about you doesn't mean that you don't have a problem in this area of your life. And Absalom would stand by the gate, which was the place where decisions were made. This is where all the leaders of the cities would, would, would gather. And uh, uh, he, he liked to, you know, he, he kind of positioned himself to be around the, 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 the powerful. Point number three, the Absaloms of this world are good with hiding who they really are and positioning themselves with people more powerful than themselves. So bitter people often just, it's kind of parasitic. They, they look for that, 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 that larger figure so they can also poison them. And in those gates, he was working the plan so he could steal the kingdom from his daddy. So it was when any, whenever anyone who had a lawsuit, point number four, bitter people target hurting people. So you know, they gravitate toward, toward the wounded and, and, and the abused. The disgruntled, I have found, I don't know how it's done, but the disgruntled just kind of have a way of finding each other. 
So pay attention to the types of friends you have. Because birds of a feather. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it was, whenever anyone who had a lawsuit came to the king for a decision, that Absalom would come and say, what city are you from? Bitter people on the surface seem to care. But underneath all they, 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 really, they don't really care about you, they just care about getting even. You're merely your tool, a means to an end, to help them make whatever point their bitter heart wants to make. A woman on the rebound will do things she would never do any other time. A man on the rebound would be dumber. Okay. See, I have a lot of life experience behind this pulpit here, and I, I got to learn to give it out in just doses. And he would say, your servant is from such and such a tribe in Israel. Then Absalom would say to him, so he had, his, he had an M.O., look, look, your case is good and right, but, but there's no deputy of the king to hear you. Number six, bitter people are constant fault finders. They can very quickly point out everything wrong without mentioning what's good and right. right. Okay. Now you do need uh, critics in your life, and you knew, do need to, to, to deal with things that aren't right and not wrong, but, but what happens with, with the Absaloms of this world, they, they can't find any good. They're the only one that got something good and that, that's fair, they're the only one that cares, and, and they, 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 just, they just look for the wrong. And they focus on the wrong, and, and, and when, when all you could see is what's wrong in a person, and you can no longer see the good qualities in that person, you're dealing with a root of bitterness. Look, your case is good and right, but there's no deputy of the king to hear you. Notice Absalom did not attack the king directly. He used insinuation. He used ingratiation. He made himself likable. And he also used the rolling of the eyes. Some people are smart enough not to say it, but you see it all over their face. <laughs> and what, 70, 90 percent of communication is nonverbal. So you might not be able to get it on a tape recorder, but it's been said, and God is watching yes. what we do. I would rather an enemy who admits they hate me instead of a friend who secretly puts me down. Moreover, Absalom would say in the gate, this is David's son, oh, that I were made judge in the land, back to point number one, self-promotion. And anyone who has a suit or cause would come to me, and I would give him justice. And so it was whenever anyone came near to bow down to him, and he loved it, that he would put out his hand and take him and kiss him. Point number seven, the bitter often feel that they are the voice of reason a man or woman of the people, and they think they're more caring. They think they're more in touch with the needs of others than the folks that God has set in place. So he would come and, and he'd kiss the hand, and again, he's ingratiating himself, and, and if you come to me because I care, I, he didn't say David's a bad man, but it's implied. And everyone knew what was going on, and he wasn't just doing this with the people, he was doing it at the gate. Other leaders were watching. And he was gathering a crowd, and he was gathering a, a, a team and, and an assembly and, and a group of people that he could get an agreement so he can ultimately revolt against his father. In this manner, meaning this is what he did, he had, a, like I said earlier, he had an MO, a modus operandi. This is the way he operated. 
In this manner, Absalom acted toward all Israel who came to the king. Now, they were coming for the king. This guy was supposed to be representing the king, but he twisted it and made it about his advancement, who came to the king for judgment. So watch this and we're done. So Absalom stole, stole. He didn't just want to, he didn't, he stole the hearts of the men of Israel. People went for it. People bought it. Absalom was strategic. Point number eight, bitterness is a thief. Yes. Wow. Yes. Wow. Bitterness not only steals from you, or better, it doesn't only steals from others. The big point is it steals from you, your innocence, your integrity. And Absalom was left, and next week we'll wrap this up, I believe. By his own strength, Absalom was going to take the kingdom from his father. By this time, David's a little bit older. David's not as strong as he used to be, but David was still God's man. David made mistakes, but it was still God who appointed him, and he wasn't to be sat down or removed until God moved him. But Absalom allowed his bitterness to speak to him like a prophet. His bitterness spoke to him with such authority that he felt invincible. He was, his hair and his youth and, and, his, and all this charisma and all that he had going for him, he used it and stole the hearts of Israel. If any daddy was brokenhearted, at this point, in fact, David wrote a psalm during this, this next period, and I'll bring that up perhaps next week, and we can see what was going on in his heart. David, I mean, it's one thing, someone you don't know, but the, the little one you had bouncing on your knee, and the, the, the little baby that you had the highest hopes for, and the one that looks like you, acts like you. Absalom stole the hearts of the men of Israel. But the reason he did it was because his heart got bitter. And I have watched men in marriages 40 years not deal with issues, and then that bitterness rise up. And all of a sudden, they're with a woman half their age. I've seen women, beautiful women, beautiful. But because of bitterness, they're 40 but look 60. Bitterness is setting yourself on fire and hoping the people around you die of the smoke. In the book of James, James makes this observation. He says, anger does not work the righteousness of God. This is something I had to get as a younger man, and even as an older man, I still find myself sometimes when I watch these movies rooting for the revenge. How many of y'all do the same thing? Yeah, 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 yeah. I felt if I, my anger meant God ought to do something, because I'm angry. But my anger doesn't work the righteousness. It don't make God do nothing. God is God. God is the judge. If I stay angry, I'm the foolish one, because only God can be angry and just completely all at the same time. He's loving, merciful, kind, and also 
he could be just all at the same time. But when humans, that's the whole thing. I'm not, I'm not built to handle the type of anger that people might try or life might try to put on me. And God's like, you're right, I didn't build you for that. So let me be God, you be man. Okay. This is how the Bible says it. It says, vengeance, Derek, is mine. I will repay. Vengeance is God's prerogative. I put myself in the place of God when I try to exact vengeance. He says, I am God, vengeance is mine, I'm not going to steal from God. And sometimes we try to get even, we don't realize that we're stealing the prerogative of God. We're acting like little gods. And God said, no, vengeance belongs to me. Boy, as smart as you think you are, you won't get it right. I'll do it, when I'm through, I won't go to jail. Matter of fact, I'll get it so right, they might even come to me. That's right. Jesus took Paul, the man that was persecuting, killing, and beating Christians, and he said, Paul, it's hard to kick against the goats, ain't it? And then by the time Jesus was through, Paul's on his knees talking about, Lord, <laughs> most of us would have prayed God kill him. He's killing Christians, we're justified in asking that, kill him. That's why I leave that to God, because only God knew what he placed inside that man. And that man or woman you hate, God may not be through it yet. There may be something divine placed in him that only that person can do. And you got to give it to God, give it to God, give it to God, give it to God, give it to God. I'm done. Jesus. The Garden of Gethsemane, he said, oh, Father, can this cup pass for me? Pray three times. He's never been separated from Father, all eternity, they're always one. So what was going to happen on the cross physically was going to be awful, but the worst part for Jesus was to be separated from the Father. He took God's wrath, he became sin, and the punishment that was supposed to be ours was laid on him. So he took it spiritually, emotionally, physically, in every possible way. And he said, Lord, hey, I ain't never done nothing like that before. See, you know, I've sinned and come back, but he ain't never done that. He was the first. He didn't sin, you know what I mean, but he took it. Father, if it be your will, it is cut past me. God didn't say yes. So Jesus drank the cup of every bad thing ever done to us, every bad thing you've ever done. He drank the cup to its bitter dregs, and he took it for you and me. Jesus died for you, but he also died for that person that hurt you and wounded you. I know, I know, I know. We have to learn to leave it. It doesn't mean you don't get mad, and please don't misunderstand. I get mad. People do stuff, and I'll just have to pause in my office for a minute. Sometimes I have to pick up the phone, uh, this was, you got some advice? I got to talk it through. And a lot of times, forgiveness begins like a seed. It's just a choice I make. It's not a feeling I have. The feeling comes later. 
but it's the choice that I'm not going to go there with that person. I'm not going to turn. I'm, I'm not going to return evil for evil, but I'm going to return good for evil. Jesus said, blessed are you when you're reviled, used, and people say all manner of evil. He said, blessed are you when you get there. He said, so they treated the prophets of old, meaning you're in good company. So when people do things to you, you are actually in good company. And now you have an opportunity to prove your faith. A lot of people settle for being church people, but Jesus wants us to be Christians. The Christ I know had holes in his hands, holes in his feet, yet he said, forgive them, they don't know what they're doing. And then instead of killing everybody, he said it was finished. And then at the end of that, he did not take matters into his own hand. He waited three days for the Father to raise him from the dead and vindicate him. Can you trust God to be your vindication? Can you trust God to handle it in His way? Do you really have faith in your life and in your heart? The end of the book of Galatians, the Galatian church had been fighting with Paul and criticizing him, and he gets to the end of it, he says, trouble me no more. For I bear in my body the marks of the Lord Jesus Christ. He didn't say, I'm an apostle. He didn't say that one day I'll be one of the most celebrated Christians that have ever lived. His authority were the marks of the Lord Jesus Christ, meaning he had holes in his hands, holes in his feet. He took the beating but kept loving. He took the criticism but kept speaking the truth. He he took the rejection but he kept reaching out. Many of us have crosses. We wear around our necks uh, earrings. We do this even when we pray. But God's not looking for a bumper sticker at your jewelry. He wants to see if you have holes in your hands, holes in your feet. Did you love somebody even when it hurt? You need to understand that Israel at that time is the church. What happened when Amnon and Tamar happened at church? This was the first family. David was a prophet. And in church, these awful things happen. Absalom rose up in the church against his daddy. And many of us never going back to church because you had some church hurt. But Jesus is saying, I don't want you to be a just, just, just churchified person. I want you to be a Christ follower. I need you to learn about the holes in the hands and the holes in the feet. I want you to learn about loving, imperfect people. The problem with church is people, not Jesus, it's the people. Wherever you got people, you got trouble, you got problems, you got issues. And this church is no different, and I'm not speaking of anything I know of, so please, I'm not. If y'all arguing with somebody, I don't know, okay? It's just my message today. But you'll know them by their love, and true love loves the unlovely.